stream or well, I as a TB uh, doctor and T myself uh, being a clinician dream of a day when we will diagnose TB in like in 15 minutes uh, full diagnosis which will be very cheap and actually gene expert technology we are saying it's point of care but requires resources to be implemented it needs internet it requires uh, more or less trained staff it requires space it requires electricity <laughs> so uh, i would say that when we of course in european region this should not be a problem but even in european region we have 63% coverage with refurbishing testing so we need better technology and test i think and treatment okay six months four months this is great but any infection is treated in maximum two weeks doctor infectious disease doctor would provide a two weeks antibiotic therapy why it is not possible for tb so this is the dream of any i would say that's where we should go it's great compared to 36 months to have six but even six months because when a, when a new patient comes that patient doesn't know that before it was 36 months and doesn't feel revealed because of that, that he or she now should be treated with six months because six months is huge from the patient perspective anyway. this We know that before it was 36 months and 24 months, etc. But for a patient who is coming from the general population, not doctor, they contract a disease and their experience of treating, uh, contracting other disease, maybe they had to lie for a virus for five days, for some infection, maybe for 10 days, and now six months, still, it's huge. So this should be the future, we hope, we dream of this. So Georgia has been a high multi-drug resistant tuberculosis burden country until 2016. Uh, Georgia first conducted the drug resistance survey in 2005 and 6, and we identified, we discovered the country actually was having high rates of multi-drug resistance, having such patients in the country and not having access to the second line to be treatment. So before drug resistance survey, the magnitude of this DRTB problem was unknown to the uh, program managers and to the Ministry of Health. But after the survey, it was already clear that we are providing inadequate treatment to at least 20% of TB patients who turned to be drug resistant. And by default, they would be treated with the first line anti-tuberculosis drugs because there wouldn't be other options. So I would I should say that in, in the fight against tuberculosis, I want to uh, underline the importance of surveillance towards drug resistance for Georgia specifically towards we because we we were high MDR TB burden countries that really uncovered the magnitude of the problem and gave us opportunity to uh, have access, to gain access to the second line TB treatment. In 2008, we were able to treat the first patient with the second line TB treatment, with the second line drugs and second line treatment, first MDR TB uh, patients. I would say that um, until 2016, Georgia was high MDR TB burden countries, but thanks to the interventions that were including very early access to the rapid diagnostics, Georgia has implemented GeneXpert, uh, started to implementation of GeneXpert technology back in 2013. Uh, we already had access to the life-saving treatment of pedaculine uh, in uh, 2013 and 14, and in 15 we already had a programmatic access, uh, universal access to all new and repurposed uh, tuberculosis drugs such as pedaculine, delaminate, and linazolid. Georgia actually was the prime candidate of receiving pedaculine through the uh, USA donation program back in 2016. So Georgia was the first country to receive the USA donation. In terms of um, 
incidence uh, until 2019, Georgia was declining on average percent change was about six to seven percent of TB cases, all TB cases. I'm not just mentioning MDR tuberculosis uh, and treatment outcomes has been improving uh, gradual and consistent and uh, uh, a very um, thorough implementation of all the innovations that World Health Organization and other uh, international organizations were um, uh, recommending. So starting from the uh, molecular technologies for diagnostics, uh, new treatment options for MDR-TB uh, MDR patients. Um, uh, since 2019, we have activated our um, interventions towards active screening and prevention. And now we are only targeting the risk groups, intravenous drug users being the most um, vulnerable group among them for Georgia. We are talking now for Georgia specifics and the highest uh, TB case detection rate th through systematic screening was observed and is being observed among intravenous drug users in this country. Welcome, friends, to this episode of NTV Dialogues, 90 for 90 Global Voices series. Today is 22nd September, where, when world leaders will, will be meeting at the United Nations General Assembly high-level meeting on tuberculosis. Uh, this is a very important global meet. It's the second of its kind on TB ever in history. This is a very special episode, uh, especially to mark UNHLM on TB. And uh, we have amongst us a very special guest who was on the front lines of fighting TB in Georgia. She is uh, no other than Dr. Nino Lomtadze. Uh, forgive me, Dr. Nino, if I pronounce your name uh, incorrectly. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity and indeed this is uh, a remarkable day that this interview is taking place actually you pronounce my last name very correctly um this is great pleasure to be part of these interviews and share some of the experience or um, struggle or fight that we are all together taking against tuberculosis in our tiny small countries and globally as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nino. Uh, so friends, uh, uh, she has a very distinguished career in the fight against TB and other health issues as well. So Dr. Nino heads uh, surveillance and strategic planning uh, department at uh, in, in Georgia at the National TB program in Georgia. Uh, she did her master's of science from Emory University a doctor's diploma from uh, Tuil Diani Medical University. She has almost 20 years of experience in TB program management, both locally and internationally, including in planning, implementing scientific and implementation research, as well as she is a WHO expert and consultant on range of uh, issues. Ni Dr. Nino has also led the implementation of various innovations within TB programs, including the implementation of new TB drugs with shorter treatment and prevention regimens, very important, active drug safety and monitoring and management, video supported treatment and active systematic treating using computer aided diagnostics. So. Thanks a lot for spurring innovation, Dr. Nino. A very long and distinguished uh, experience you have in the fight against TB. And especially because in the last 20 years, or let's say last 10 years or 15 years, a lot has happened in terms of innovations which you spurred uh, internationally and, and also helped to, to promote it internationally. So uh, welcome again, Dr. Nino. So uh, I think uh, without any further ado, let us hear from you. Where are we on the fight against TB in Georgia? Thank you very much. And uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, in, the, in the list of implementation of these interventions, uh, a huge teamwork, it really takes a village to implement those innovations and uh, interventions. And uh, this is... Uh, uh, all going, all the um, acknowledgement should go to the great doctors, healthcare workers, uh, colleagues in Georgia who are um, on the front, in the front lines of fight against tuberculosis. Uh, and so I'm just part of this important venture. 
Indeed, it is an amazing time for anyone working in tuberculosis because there are so many innovations. Uh, I, I can't imagine living in other era than we are living now in terms of fighting against tuberculosis because uh, so many innovations are happening and it really gives us additional stimulus and um, uh, motivation to uh, be involved in these processes. So Georgia has been, has. Uh, actually never been a high TB burden country, but has been a high multi-drug resistant tuberculosis burden country until 2016. Uh, Georgia first conducted the drug resistance survey in 2005 and 6, and we identified, we discovered the country actually was having high rates of multi-drug resistance by then, we were only identifying MDR tuberculosis, which was at least resistance to rifampicin and INH. Uh, having such patients in the country and not having access to the second line to be treatment. So before drug resistance survey, the magnitude of this DRTB problem was unknown to the uh, program managers and to the Ministry of Health. But after the survey, it was already clear that we are providing inadequate treatment to at least 20% of TB patients who turned to be drug resistant. And by default, they would be treated with the first line antituberculosis drugs because there wouldn't be other options. So I, would, I should say that in, in the fight against tuberculosis, I want to uh, underline the importance of surveillance towards drug resistance for Georgia specifically, towards we because we we were high MDR TB burden countries that really uncovered the magnitude of the problem and gave us opportunity to uh, have access to gain access to the second line TB treatment. By then, the special procedures had to take place. A country had to receive a green light from WHO, uh, providing justification that guide justifications that the, those drugs would be used according to the WHO recommendations. And so, in two thousand eight, we were able to treat the first patient with the second line TB treatment with the second line drugs and second line treatment, first MDR TB uh, patients. Of course treatment for drug sensitive tuberculosis was available through government and donor support. And we should mention the importance of global fund support for country Georgia, which is also uh, enormous uh, in fight against tuberculosis. Since then, countries' epidemics has been gradually and steadily declining. I would say that um, until 2016, Georgia was high MDR TB burden countries, but thanks to the interventions that were including very early access to the rapid diagnostics. Georgia has implemented GeneXpert, uh, started to implementation of GeneXpert technology back in 2013. Uh, we already had access to the life-saving treatment of pedaculine uh, in uh, 2013 and 14, and in 15 we already had a programmatic access, uh, universal access to all new and repurposed uh, tuberculosis drugs such as pedaculine, delaminate, and linazolate. And uh, it was remarkable support from different organizations, international organizations such as MSF, Global Fund, and USAID, which we should definitely mention because Georgia actually was the prime candidate of receiving that through the uh, USAID donation program back in 2016. So Georgia was the first country to receive the USAID donation. Um, and uh, of course, for an environment, remember the number of courses for 160 courses from 160 patients, which by then was maybe 20% of what was really needed for uh, MDR-TB patients. Um, in terms of um, incidence, uh, 
uh, until 2019, Georgia was declining on average person change was about six to seven percent of TB cases, all TB cases. I'm not just mentioning MDR tuberculosis uh, and the treatment outcomes has been improving. Uh, in already in 2016, Georgia has reached the WHO target of uh, uh, treatment success rate of 85% for drug sensitive tuberculosis. And we have been struggling of uh, for achieving the treatment success rate targets for multi drug resistant tuberculosis, which is which was and still is 75%, but we know the global action plan targets and also also the uh, NTTB targets for European region, they are already much higher. Success rates for tubercul MDR tuberculosis should be more than 85% uh, by 2025. So it's we're still on the way. Uh, uh, however, the um, uh, gradual and consistent and uh, uh, a very um, thorough implementation of all the innovations that World Health Organization and other uh, international organizations were um, uh, recommending, so starting from the uh, molecular technologies for diagnostics, uh, new treatment options for MDRTB uh, MDR patients. Um, uh, since 2019, we have activated our um, interventions towards active screening and prevention, which has not been that much uh, um, of uh, uh, that much active or um, uh, with that with not that much coverage before because yeah we the priorities were to diagnose and treat TB patients and you never have enough resources to systematic to conduct systematic screening and prevention uh, so, so starting 2019 Georgia is already implementing systematic screening of um, uh, active of TB risk groups. We actually had uh, experience of uh, screening general population, which turned to be uh, not effective intervention for Georgia. We we identified very low number uh, of TB cases compared to the enormous resources that is really needed for implementation of systematic screening. But we gained experience, and now we are only targeting the risk groups, intravenous drug users being the most vulnerable group among them for Georgia. We are talking now for Georgia specifics and the highest uh, TB case detection rate th through systematic screening was observed and it's being observed among intravenous drug users in this country. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nino. Absolutely, uh, you know, very important overview. And uh, I will uh, congratulate you and all your team to, uh, you know, to bring uh, Georgia out of the list of uh, the high FDRTB burden countries. Uh, this is certainly a big progress uh, uh, for Georgia. And also very impressed to know that Georgia was the first country to roll out the new treatment regimens or molecular tests uh, in 2013, if I got it right. Right, right, and even now, uh, the molecular test uh, uh, use of molecular tests, uh, you know, universally for presumptive TB cases, which is WHO guidance, is uh, yet to become a reality in so many high burden nations. So, compliments on doing the right things uh, so early on, and uh, we and def and also to get a result with drop in cases of drug resistance and being out of the list of high burden nations. You had the lever for innovation since so early on in the TB response. So it would be great. Uh, first of all, please do finish your overview. I'm sorry I spoke so much. Yeah. But, and, but also it would be good to come back to hear I more do. of innovations. Uh, Thank you. I want to emphasize more on the coverage of the new molecular technologies. So well, the indicator that we are regularly monitoring and WHO is also monitoring, this is the number of, and percentage of TB cases that were diagnosed using GeneXpert or other molecular technology. And the indicator in Georgia was gradually increasing and for last five years, it has reached 95%. So 95% of tuberculosis cases in Georgia have been diagnosed using uh, gene expert technology. And, uh, and while working inside country, we think that it is not still not 100%, uh, 
I was just recently reviewing the data from European region, not even talking about uh, Africa or other regions, from European region. The uh, coverage of reef resistance testing in European region is 63%. So only for 63% of common area, I should emphasize, so to exclude the bias of the extra pulmonary tuberculosis that's, um, uh, that, that might have less uh, bacteriological confirmation. So among pulmonary tuberculosis in this region where we, we live now in Georgia, European region, the coverage is only 63%. So uh, despite the enormous resources, despite the uh, support from the donors, still, and despite the feasibility and ease of implementation of the molecular technologies, as you mentioned, Frontline, I mean, now gene expert, still there are barriers. And uh, this is not possible so far to reach uh, the uh, needed uh, targets. Of and of course, it, it impacts the treatment outcomes. Meaning that if if in European region we diag we only know for sixty three percent that reef resistance is there or not, this means that for thirty seven percent we are implementing treatment blindly, not knowing whether the germ is resistant or sensitive to the very the most important drug refampicin, right? So this uh, this of course impacts treatment outcomes, and I would say that this also impacts still low uh, treatment success rate in this region, which is below this eighty five percent for drug sensitive tuberculosis. Um, uh, so uh, another important uh, message I would say that indeed the coverage with uh, using gene expert technology is a key in uh, tackling and uh, the epidemics and uh, ensuring better treatment outcomes. I would say that this helped us to improve the treatment success rates for drug sensitive tuberculosis because from day one or at least day two, patient pulmonary tuberculosis patient would receive adequate treatment and wouldn't receive uh, first line TB standard TB treatment, not knowing whether they are susceptible to those drugs or not. So this is one of the message, and we've reached this um, ninety-five percent since twenty nineteen, uh, and uh, keep this uh, um, level. However, I would say that uh, the indicator has a, a limitation in it. It 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 measures how many patients were who were diagnosed for TB had access to gene expert diagnostics, but which is most important, how many mm, TB suspects had access to gene expert, which is not regularly monitored and measured. And I think this should be the next, I mean, next indicator for WHO, et cetera, to, to really ensure that countries are ensuring the uh, required uh, level of implementation to look at the coverage among TB suspects, not among tuberculosis patients, which would then really reveal the bottlenecks in the implementation of the technology. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, GeneXpert Ultra, we have already started implementation GeneXpert XDR, which uh, allows again, within um, an hour to uh, provide uh, provide information on resistance to INH and fluoroquinolones, in addition to other drugs, which are uh, which are also important, but maybe not as important as these two drugs, which this means that uh, within a day, we know that the patient is or not rifampicin resistant. If sensitive, whether isonized would be working because we are living in a high INH resistance prevalence region. Uh, INH resistance is quite high. So, uh, so this uh, is important to know whether we are dealing with the polydrug resistance with INH considering treatment regimen provided by and recommended by WHO differs from what would be in case of uh, drug fully drug sensitive tuberculosis. Uh, so um, this is uh, also important. Mm, uh, I want to talk about the implementation of the short treatment regimens. 
uh, for drug-resistant tuberculosis, and now also for drug-sensitive tuberculosis, considering the latest WHO guidelines are recommending now really shorter treatment regimens and options. Uh, for drug-resistant tuberculosis, WHO uh, issued a rapid communication back in 2018, August, if I'm not wrong, that countries can implement uh, short, fully oral treatment regimens. And Georgia really also, I think, was one of the first countries in implementing the shorter, fully oral, injectable-free treatment regimens in, since uh, April 2019. And in June 2019, the national treatment guidelines were already updated and recommending uh, uh, injectable free treatment regimens for the tuberculosis to be patients. I think this is a huge step forward for overall tuberculosis uh, community to say no to the injectable agents, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which really, uh, in case of Georgia, uh, has impacted the treatment success rates of MDR tuberculosis patients. Of course, it's uh, difficult to really uh, uh, separate uh, different implementation impact level of different specific implementations because this is combined efforts. Simultaneously, we were implementing fully oral treatment regimens, injectable free, plus they were now shorter, so the shortness of regimen is important. Plus, we have started implementation since 2018 for the whole country, the video supported treatment. So patients no longer needed to visit TB facility or TB unit or nurse, remote nurse daily basis, which is another great barrier, was a great barrier for treatment success rate, while on the other hand was a guarantee that the patient is really in taking the treatment. But again, the intervention was way uh, not patient-centered. So um, I want to name those multiple factors that has supported us in declining the MDRTB numbers and epidemics and increasing the treatment success rate, which for the cohort of the 2020 was already 78% for uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis, which is a little bit higher than the WHO mm -hmm. target for this current period of 75%. Uh, while Back in 2014, for instance, before the year before programmatic implementation of new drugs, treatment success of MDRTB was 43% in Georgia. So it so less than half of patients would be favorably treated with the second line antituberculosis to at least 24 month long treatment regimens with at least eight months of injectable agents. Uh, and of course, this was. Uh, this was very frustrating, and I remember the mm, the depression among among all. I'm talking about Georgian and TB community and George uh, TB doctors and healthcare workers that you are providing treatment which is which has having uh, serious adverse events, autotoxicity, um, acute uh, kidney toxicity. Uh, electrolyte disbalance, name the, the serious, very serious adverse events. Uh, and on the other hand, we have tuberculosis germ that we hope it would be, it will be killed. And with these interventions, we are still achieving with this toxic interventions, uh, not talking about the quality of life of TB patients and of lack of treatment, which was sometimes 36 months, I remember. Sometimes 36 months, we were reaching just 43% treatment success rate. So new TB drugs, were, this was kind of an enigma for, I think, for a whole TB society. Bedacolin and uh, uh, linazolid and delamanid, these are life saving. However, we have implemented those drugs since 2015 programmatically, but treatment success became higher, but not that high that would we would need it. So I would say that since 2018, only after when we started shorter, fully oral treatment regimens, when we started implementation of the video supported treatment for all MDRTB patients countrywide, so they do not need, need to visit 
to be uh, their um, uh, clinics day on a daily basis. And actually, we have trained our nurses. Um, so we allowed our nurses to work from remotely. So they didn't need to visit their actual working place during the day, but uh, they were receiving calls, video calls by then. It was Viber and um, uh, Skype not uh, application we started to implement application dedicated uh, georgian um, t app adhere tb since 2019 countrywide but by then we were using the those resources that we use to receive those calls even during the evening times and even before going to bed and this was great because patients had a chance to receive drug in their houses before going to sleep, so they will oh. outsleep the adverse events. And on the other day in the morning, they would have energy and um, motivation to go to school or work, etc. So uh, this, so all these factors, multiple factors, I uh, assume has supported to the increase, like 10% 10, 10 increase for last uh, four or three years of treatment success rates for multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and not just for fluoroquinolone sensitive tuberculosis. So not for just purely MDR, but also for pre-XDR and XDR TB. For instance, in the same cohort in 2020, we have XDR tuberculosis treatment outcome. And I'm defining XDR now by the new definition of XDR, which is resistance to the group A drugs uh, fluoroquinolones plus either resistance to bedaquiline, all in as leader both. Among them, we have reached sixty-eight percent treatment success rate, which, which if compared again to the twenty fourteen, it was thirty-two percent for XDR tuberculosis treatment success. And the numbers were much bigger than we are facing now. For instance, uh Last year, we had just 186 MDRT patients in the whole country, when back in 2011, it was almost 800 uh, MDRT cases. So um, when we are talking about the UNHLM uh, targets and uh, those 90 months that we have left, so from starting from 2015, we have uh, decreased in Georgia the number the incidence uh, by more than 50 percent so we hope that by 2030 or 2035 we will add additional 50 percent <laughs> uh, to have the incidence to back to the 10 per hundred thousand mm, uh, so far georgia incidence of georgia is 43 cases per hundred thousand um, uh, patients we are um, middle burden country. Um, however, WHO is estimating that we should be having at least 60 cases per 100,000 population, uh, meaning that we have problems with the case finding. Of course, it is uh, questionable sometimes. So we question uh, also WHO uh, regarding the TB estimates, right, estimated incidence rates and the methodology using which it is calculated. And um, we are providing justification and evidence that this is a little bit high than we in reality think. Because uh, back in 2011, for instance, the case detection rate, now WHO calls it treatment coverage, right? So this is the ratio of notified TB cases against the estimated number by WHO was higher than 100%. So it was 106, for instance, in 2011, when there was no gene expert technology, no innovations, no new TB drugs. We as a program, by our, I work in the program since 2004. So we as a program, we're not identifying ourselves as a successful program. And by then, based on this, um, on the estimation of WHO, we were overreaching the estimation. And after we have started to implement the new technologies, new treatment options, new case finding uh, um, strategies, such as systematic screening, 
uh, we have introduced preventive new regimens for preventive treatment. The case detection rate, so Georgia is performing worse and worse if we will um, uh, judge a country based on this treatment coverage rate of WHO. Uh, so um, we are having dialogue and actually last year WHO has decreased the estimation for Georgia and this year as well. Uh, I, I, we understand that this might be a um, methodology that is um, really um, providing maybe some biased number, uh, but we acknowledge that we, of course we are not detecting 100% of TB patients, but we're just arguing that it's not possible that we are, for instance, detecting only 50% of MDR-TB patients, which by that, by that um, indicator seems to be like this. Uh, so um, case detection. Case detection, not to that magnitude as WHO is uh, assigning, but is, seems to, is problem. And COVID-19 played a huge role in that. If you look at the trend of TB notification against the WHO estimates, and you know WHO provides the lower and upper limits of their best estimates, like confidence interval. Uh, until COVID-19, Georgia was within the confidence limits of the WHO estimation. For, for that reason, uh, to increase the case detection rate and uh, case finding, um, um, we started implementation of the active screening uh, technologies, including the computer aided technology. We are specifically using the CAD for TB um, uh, platform uh, for uh, um, uh, detecting the for uh, screening active screening of the target populations. We are having we are, we have a vehicle dedicated vehicle uh, which is equipped with the full range uh, X-ray machine, which is linked, uh, attached to this artificial intelligence platform, CAD4TB, in one space. In another space, we have a room for uh, uh, gene expert. So gene expert machine is also situated in this uh, um, vehicle, which is used for the systematic screening of the target population. Uh, and also we can we have possibility to draw blood and conduct uh, uh, screening uh, uh, of uh, also do the blood test etc in order to uh, have a germ for the uh, screened patients to really come because sometimes when you say we are screening for TB, stigma is playing a huge role but if you are providing additional services that might not be directly linked to the TB case detection. For instance, uh, last year, for last two years, we have conducted six disease screening. That's how we call it, but it included tuberculosis, HIV, and hepatitis C. Exactly, we were using the gene expert cartridges that, that uh, are providing the uh, diagnostics for HCV and HIV as well. Uh, but in ad additionally, we were also providing measurements for blood glucose. Uh, measure, uh, measurement for um, uh, uh, blood pressure uh, and, uh, um, and physical examination by a doctor. So these additional uh, services were provided by within the screening uh, vehicle. Um, uh, how it is organized? So a team of a um, radiologist la, uh, radiologist um, technician we don't we do not need a doctor radiologist so we uh, include a radiologist technician a um, lab technician who can <coughs> take sample from tb patients <coughs> and a coordinator who is organized who is providing recording patient data, et cetera, in order to uh, make all the process uh, um, registered and um, uh, have data recorded, are sent to the field. For instance, for intravenous drug users, we used, um, our, we used uh, OST programs, opiate substitution programs. Uh, we have, we call it, we have methadone substitution programs, which are uh, in, almost all cities of Georgia, 
Uh, and so it was convenient because uh, referral to these OST programs is very high. They um, intravenous drug users uh, or other drug users, they are regularly and daily basis visiting. So if, if an OST clinic has <coughs> 100 uh, client, all 100 would be visiting that place on a daily basis. So it was convenient for, from the point of view of organizing the screening because for a week or two, we could screen a huge amount of intravenous drug users. And intravenous drug use is a problem in Georgia. There are, uh, it is much higher problem than, I'm sorry, tuberculosis or HIV. And it, it, it was linked with the hepatitis C. But Georgia has implemented HCV elimination programs starting 2015, which also was including the integrated HCV, TB, and HIV screening for general population. And of course, intravenous drug users were part of them. But uh, we assume that TB screening was suffering because uh, <clears throat> It was conducted by a questionnaire by then in the uh, within the integrated screening um, program. You, there was a test for HIV, test for HCV, but for TB nothing. It was just a questionnaire, and uh, apparently many cases were missed. So now we are implementing it with an X-ray technology, and the. Uh, for instance, last year we screened up to 3,000 intravenous drug users and uh, we detected 15 TB cases, out of which five were multidrug resistant uh, TB, and they have never known that they had tuberculosis. So it was, well, considering that we just have 186 uh, MDR TB patients in a year, five cases derived from that target group is a really good, huge contribution for, for MDR TB cases, for instance. So this is one of the intervention. Of course, this uh, the systematic screening requires a huge amount of resources and human resources capacity and coordination, uh, because this is uh, different from doctors going to the on a daily basis to their clinic for work, while will they have to travel and be in the field so it requires additional incentives and support for the clinicians and uh, healthcare workers as well. But uh, for if for correctly selected target groups, this is the um, uh, impact and the result really outweigh the um, way the um, contribution or resources that are needed. Mm. Talking about the TB prevention, I should say that. Georgia was implementing the old WHO recommendations regarding the pre TB prevention, meaning that we were only proposing preventive TB treatment for uh, household contacts aged up to five years. So mm -hmm. this was the uh, before starting implementation of the new um, prophylactic treatment regimens. Uh, this was the only group that would be offered a preventive TB treatment. Starting 2019, uh, we started to implement the shorter preventive treatment regimen, such as 3HR, which is um, three, uh, which is 12 weeks of uh, um, 12 dose, which is which are taken weekly of rifepentine and INH. And uh, with this regimen, we are now off with this regimen are now offered to all household and close contacts. Of course, this is not mandatory, but uh, so doctors are offering it to everyone, and it's then up to patients' decision whether they will take it or not. Yes. It's not yes. uh, mandatory to take prophylactic treatment, even if a <clears throat> person is a contact of the <laughs> active tuberculosis patient. And coverage, despite this, despite this not, not being mandatory and being voluntary for the household and close contacts to take, the coverage of the prophylactic treatment has increased tenfold. So, uh, of course, uh, this is important, but we are still far from the targets. 
And uh, I would say that the most of the work that we as a program organizers and program managers have to work is to work towards uh, uh, preventive treatment and systematic screening for Georgia, because uh, treatment rates are already, um, treatment success rates are already um, more or less acceptable. Uh, so without prevention and systematic screening, uh, uh, I think we would be very slowly declining uh, for the, uh, you know, when it's last portion left, the slowest is the decline because uh, um, those big interventions really have uh, happened the epidemics, but now we need more fine interventions to really target. And this is very challenging. This is very challenging because there are some skeptics among even healthcare workers towards uh, prophylactic TB treatment. Um, and uh, so it requires a lot of work uh, to advocate the treatment regimen, not for just uh, uh, contacts and uh, population, but also for healthcare workers to healthcare workers. So this in we are working in this direction and um, uh, dealing with uh, uh, daily problems or issues, but hopefully solving them. And uh, uh, we hope that this uh, the combination of these multiple interventions will allow us to uh, really <clears throat> have the case detection rate uh, and uh, achieved and also decline the TB epidemics in Georgia. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nino. Absolutely amazing. You know, uh, I was just spellbound, uh, you know, hearing you and listening to the long journey of the Georgia had and and the and the impact and uh, just amaz amazed to see from 32% uh, treatment success rate for XDR jumping to 68. That's a huge uh, difference uh, things can make if done correctly. Sorry, you were saying something. Yes, exactly. Without uh, technologies, I want to say more about research. If we, if time allows, of course. Bobby, sure, sure, sure. Please do. Yeah. Please. Um. Despite the small number of TB cases, while well, Georgia is a very small country, and numbers of we population of Georgia is three point seven million. Can you can imagine with the incidence rate of forty three cases per hundred thousand? What numbers, of course, are very small. But despite the small number, I should say that Georgia has also been on the front line of implementing TB-related research. And uh, uh, not just um, uh, internally doctor or uh, uh, clinically driven research, but also Georgia has been part of the multi-center uh, trials, including the Xenix trial that was um, published just in last year the, or this year i think publication and one of the authors is what is one of the our doctors uh, lali mikiashvili of this publication the xenix trial which opened the completely new treatment strategies for mdrtb patients of six months of bpal and moxifloxacin and uh, i forgot to mention that we have already started implementation of the bpal moxie this year for rifampicin and resistant tuberculosis patients however we were implementing bpal without moxifloxacin for pre xtr and xtr patients starting 2020 so it uh, it has been uh, uh, before uh, before the xenix trial data would be out uh, for um, society. And what it was, of course, supported by the fact that Georgia was part of the Zinx trial back in 2018 and uh, 17 and 18. And doctors who were uh, treating the trial patients were our doctors. So they, they were very, they were have already witnessed themselves the um, efficacy and effectiveness of uh, six month treatment regimen with just three drugs one of them, which is new, pretamonid, bedaculin, pretamonid, and linezolid, uh, for XDR tuberculosis patients. And uh, I, I would say that, uh, of course, research and development plays key role <clears throat> in overall development, but being part of research also adds additional strength to the evidence 
for those doctors who have been part of this research while further implementing those strategies in the programmatic practice. So I, I just want to emphasize the impact of research on the in programmatic implementation of the new interventions is also huge, not just uh, huge that they are providing the new evidence and providing new technologies. Also, Georgia has been part of the validation studies for um, fine uh, uh, MTBDRSL and MTBDR um, uh, techniques, uh, uh, equipment, also for um, expert, uh, gene expert XDR. Uh, so uh, all this has also supported. Uh, now I'm thinking why, how it happened that we were first country. It happened because we somehow were in, also involved in the research and validation of those techniques, which uh, made us familiar to those innovations uh, a little bit maybe earlier than they would be than they would be um, uh, uh, accessible for for global community or for global TB for other TB programs. So I'm just emphasizing the willingness to be part of research and emphasizing the importance which WHO global uh, TB uh, plan and European plan now are um, urging countries. <clears throat> Third pillar of the action plan is research and innovation, right? Which means that TB programs should have a dedicated research units with a mandate to conduct TB related research within their programs and countries. And I think this is very important because uh, it ensures the building capacity building of the uh, personnel and staff in research and um, uh, research skills, etc. Which uh, and uh, having doctor scientists is very important, so which uh, which also supports very much implementation of innovations and really dilutes the skepsis or um, suspicion from clinician standpoint, which is very, which is sometimes a key barrier in implementing innovations that what, uh, what have been observed by me at least. So um, again, uh, to emphasize that uh, innovations, uh, implementation, but also being part of the research is very important. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nino, again, and our heartfelt gratitude to you, to all the TB researchers in Georgia, and especially to each of the uh, participant uh, who participated in the studies, such so important studies such as Xenix uh, study, uh, because of which we have such a strong evidence for a way better six month regimen with less toxic uh, 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 which is way less toxic than than what was used probably in Nix TB. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yeah. Zenix yeah. showed yeah. give it the evidence that we can use linozolid with uh, shorter duration and less dosage, and it produces uh, similar efficacy. Uh, and which was such an important study. Uh, am I right, uh, Doctor Dino? Such an important one. Yeah, it, it was a very. Uh, when we were conducting, we we couldn't realize it would have such impact and importance. Uh, when we were part of the multi-center trial, along with other, I think there were four sites. But now, when we're looking backwards, it's it's it has been very important. Actually, Georgia was also part of the stream stage two trial stream, um, which is also um, contributed to the. Um, we were one of the 11 countries that were involved in stream stage two. We were not part of stream stage one, but for stream stage two, we were part of the Xenix. We were part of the Nix as well, but Nix was stopped because of this hepatotoxicity. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm, so this is also yeah. simple CTB, which is also including the um, uh, pretaminate as a part of the regimen. So... Mm, this um, also is very important. We hope to be part of the um, preventive TB treatment or vaccine trials. Hopefully there will be vaccines soon. But, and of course we dream, or, well, I as a um, TB uh, doctor and T myself uh, being a clinician, dream of a day when we will diagnose TB in like in 15 minutes. Uh, 
full diagnosis, which will be very cheap. And actually, gene expert technology, we are saying it's point of care, but requires resources to be implemented. It needs internet. It requires uh, more or less trained staff. It requires space. It requires electricity. <laughs> so uh, I would say that, when we're, if, of course, in European region, this should not be a problem. But even in European region, we have 63% coverage with refurbishing testing. So this, we need better technology and test, I think. And treatment, okay, six months, four months, this is great. But any infection is treated in maximum two weeks. Doctor, infectious disease doctor would provide a two weeks antibiotic therapy. Why it is not possible for TB? So this is the dream of, I would say that's where we should go. It's great compared to 36 months to have six, but even six months, because when a, when a new patient comes, that patient doesn't know that before it was 36 months and doesn't feel revealed because of that, that he or she now should be treated with six months because six months is huge from the patient perspective anyway. This, we know that before it was 36 months and 24 months, et cetera. But for a patient who is coming from the general population, not doctor, they contract a disease and their experience of treating, uh, contracting other disease, maybe they had to lie for a virus for five days, for some infection, maybe for 10 days, and now six months, still, it's huge. So this should be the future, we hope, we dream of this. Yes, absolutely. Well, we really pray that your dreams come true. And you, you have said it all so succinctly and so right. Uh, let, uh, it's, uh, this is the dream of everyone. Uh, a question, because I know I've, we are taking too much of your time. Uh, so before we wrap up, is, uh, is about the, since Bidacoline, Delaminid, and new drugs have been used in Georgia for quite a time. So uh, um, are you doing drug susceptibility testing for, for these drugs to make, ensure there is no resistance. Oh, thank you very much. I forgot to mention about this. Uh, uh, we are performing, so we, since drug resistance survey, we have surveillance for almost all drugs that I used in the treatment for multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Uh, uh, we started implementing programmatically linazolid and uh, uh, bedaculin back in 2015, but before we had a, if you remember the compassionate use program, we were part of the compassionate use program where the individual patient dossiers were submitted. And by then we were receiving the drug resistance results from the supranational laboratories. However, since then we have developed this capacity and our laboratory is uh, able to perform the drug susceptibility testing to uh, bedaculin, linazolid and delamonid since 2019 programmatically within studies and research much way before. So within research projects, but for, for when it became part of the diagnostic algorithm uh, for the uh, drug resistant TB diagnosis and pre extra diagnosis. So we are performing it. We are also having access to the gene expert XTR. Um, the problem with the uh, diagnostics uh, towards the bedaculin and delamonid not linazolid, is pure availability of pure substances for uh, bedaculin and delamonid, which are not uh, sold. So you cannot buy those pure substances. So far, they are not on GDF list. Uh, they are not other Sigma, Aldrich, or other lists at, in catalogs. Uh, and you have to find out your uh, yourself. Well, GDF is already providing this information. So bedaculin, pure substance, I'm the person who is ordering bedaculin for Georgia through NIH AIDS program, uh, which is HIV AIDS program from US. So you register yourself as a scientist for the NIH AIDS and you can order only 20 grams of bedaculin per order. So this is the, uh, and it, it's free of charge for the programs. Uh, it just requires, so some programs still do not have access to the bedaculin and delamonid testing because they don't know this process or they don't have a capacity to go through this process. So I think it's 
it's not fair because we are already implementing six months treatment regimen where three with three drugs. One is bedacolin, and the countries who have been using drugs since 2013, when I mentioned when we had compassionate use, uh, we are we are observing resistance to bedacolin and linazolid and delaminase. Our diagnostic algorithm so far, so we are only testing bedacolin and linozolid and delamonid for pre DRTB patients. So we are not so far, our algorithm was not foreseen to do it for all rifampicin resistant TB patients, but for those rifampicin resistant TB patients who are also resistant to fluoroquinolone, such as levofloxacin and or moxifloxacin, and among pre DR. We have a uh, five percent resistance to betacolin and orlinazolid. Five percent already. So we are observing resistance, of course, and this is inevitable. Uh, for Georgia, it should be mentioned that clofazamine was used since two thousand eight, and there is a cross resistance between clofazamine and uh, clofazamine and uh, betacolin. So it might also play a role. Since the day one, we have started to use the second line treatments. Back in two thousand eight, we had clofazamine in the on the list. Um, actually, this was separately ordered. We were sending individual patient lists to. I don't remember the manufacturer, but to the manufacturer to provide clofazamine to us. So. Um, it will. Uh, so now other countries have opportunity now to look at countries who are early implementers and we see that it has been it is a problem already in Georgia we are observing resistance and it will be increasing I think with declining epidemics countries who are declining epidemics and going to the lower burden the prevalence and frequency of drug resistance would would increase so the absolute numbers might go down but we would be the um, proportion of resistance among those cases would uh, I remember Latvia example they have five cases per year and all five are MDR because it, uh, they are the hardest to treat and what is left mm -hmm. is, is what is hardest to treat and spread is not that one that is uh, susceptible to treatment so this is like a forecast it is normal that we are observing drug resistance amplification because the prevalence, the numbers should go down, but the proportion of all case, among all cases of drug resistance would inevitably increase because first of all, of the spontaneous mutations that all bacteria have and, and even without wrongly using drugs. And plus uh, we are mm, using drugs and uh, we are seeing these uh, resistance even new patients who were not treated before, which means that they accepted it bedacolin resistant strain from another person, which is spreading, right? right. So uh, uh, conducting surveillance is essential and key. We are not yet programmatically conducting surveillance to predominate, but our laboratory has methodology because within the trial we were doing the resistance towards pretermine. So we have methodology and we have staff trained and experienced already who are doing, but this is not yet for programmatic purposes. This is for research purposes. And hopefully WHO will and the GLI will already issue some recommendations for testing towards pretermine because and we're so scared. These are just three drugs and countries do not even test for bedacolin and uh, linezolid and um, so it's um, uh, it's very important uh, there is no other th thought that new drugs should come more new drugs we because we will be amplifying resistance to this one and there will still at least there will be at least one patient in every country who is totally resistant to all these drugs and we need another treatment option for them or declare them failure which is which is failure of the programs, right? So it's it shouldn't, uh, yeah. Hopefully, it will not happen. Which was happening very frequently back in, like when I mentioned examples from thirty three percent treatment success rate for XDR. 
but um, surveillance, uh, conducting surveillance is important. But uh, also what I uh, wanted to mention that about infection control, yeah. Uh, I think that the most frequent places of transmission of these strains is hospitals, are hospitals and not community. Well, in Georgia, we have like 180 patients, MDR out of them, the five might be XDR. How we assume this is uh, in uh, intra-hospital transmission plays the huge role in transmitting the resistant strains. And of course, despite the fact that Georgia has only 200 beds for the whole country, we do not hospitalize everyone. Only 15% of drug sensitive patients are hospitalized and 80% of drug resistant patients are hospitalized. There are patients who start drug resistant CB treatment right away from the outpatient treatment. We have very short hospitalization time compared to other countries in our region, because in our region it's uh, very, the hospitalization is a very, is a common practice even till the end of treatment. Our length of stay in Georgia is 28 days for MDR tuberculosis. So it varies with, uh, from six to days to 48 days, but the average length of stay is 28 days. And despite this fact, uh, and despite these infection control measures, which is very difficult to really have infection control measure in, a, in an inpatient unit, it requires a lot of resources. Even if you have this negative pleasure, pressure ventilation, you should, it requires 10 times more resources for its maintenance. And we are not European country. Maybe in EU it is possible to have everything working fluent and nice and clean. But in countries like Georgia and other resource uh, demanding countries, they might have gained some funding for making some fancy um, negative pressure ventilation, but there is no funds for its maintenance, so it's not working. Uh, or there is even no any ventilation. It's a, so uh, I think that uh, infection control measures play a huge role in uh, disease, uh, of course, in spread of disease. And I would say mostly in spread of the most dangerous strains, most resistant strains, because patients who are not drug resistant, they are on outpatient basis. We try to hospitalize those patients who have the most uh, drug resistance, right? Because they require more drugs, they require um, more, much more monitoring. Oh, I, I haven't said anything about active drug safety monitoring and management. Georgia has also been one of the first country implementing the ADSM framework uh, for uh, all MDRTB patients and the government Ministry of Health is supporting the regular monthly and uh, baseline and monthly and post-treatment follow-up tests, uh, instrumental investigations, laboratory investigations, etc. So this, uh, I wanted also to emphasize that we provide treatment, treatment should be adequate, still it's not purely and 100% safe, but we monitor for the safety. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nino, absolutely amazing, really, uh, to see, um, you know, this kind of an overview and of the journey of Georgia's fight against TB. Thank you. And, and let's, um, let's stay together globally in this yeah. fight against TB. It's not possible for separate countries to really make this happen. Absolutely. U United, we stand together to end TB. Absolutely. So thanks a lot again, Dr. Nino. Just for those who have joined us late, we were in conversation with Dr. Nino Lomtadze. She is the head of uh, uh, surveillance, very important, as well as a strategic planning department at the National TB Program in Georgia. So thanks a lot, Dr. Nino, again, and best of wishes um, for the coming uh, days, weeks. As you said, the last mile is the most difficult one, but let us hope that with the spirited people like you and your team, uh, we will be able to uh, hit the zero, which is a human right imperative as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Dr. Nino. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day and successful life. Thank you. Thank you.